Hello, beautiful people, and welcome Hi. to a quick little banner review. This is going to be a much longer banner review than my banner reviews have historically been. So for those of you that want information about a very specific thing, make sure you use the timestamps. Don't feel obligated to watch a part you're not interested in. Let's get right in. First things first, the five stars, Nebulet and Kazuha. Both of them quite good. And then the four star, Yanfei, Barbara, Singto. The weapon banner, we have Tome of the Eternal Flow, Freedom Sworn. And then we have Wine and Song, The Flute, Midnacht Waltz, Fab Lands, and Five Great Sword. Let's start with the character banners. It is no secret to even short time viewer of my channel that Singto is a pretty good unit. <laughs> So obviously, him being on the banner, pretty good. However, because he's such a good unit, then it is generally worth it to go for him in the shop and in Lantern Rite when he's available, right? It should be one of your priorities. And so if you've been playing the game for a little while, he's one of the characters that it's the most likely you have at C6 because he's available in the shop and Lantern Rite. What that means is that there's going to be a non-insignificant portion of you guys that already have have C6 and for you him being on the banner is obviously not very good because you already have him at C6 so getting more copies of him isn't great. It gets you starry litter I guess but it's not great right it's not better than getting a four star you would actually want. Barbara and Yanfei are both not the greatest. Barbara's constellations are actually pretty docked across the board and Yanfei has a few useful constellations. So let's go through them individually. First, I think so. His C1 is arguably his worst constellation. It just slightly increases the healing you get when his swords when his burst expires because you get healing from four swords instead of three. Usually you don't just like use your E and then not use your ult. And so more instances of the damage reduction doesn't matter because while in his ult, you don't lose rain swords. The rain swords don't break when you get hit. And his ult lasts for 15 seconds, 18 at C2 with a 20 second cooldown. With skill being 21 seconds, you're generally casting his burst every 21 or 22 seconds. But all this to say, uh, C1 really doesn't matter that much. It effectively only slightly increases his healing, which is already not that great. So it's not that big of a deal. C2 increases burst duration and gives him Hydro Rest Red. Quite good con. C3 increases his burst damage. Pretty good. Not quite as good as C2 because what he does for the team isn't just damage. It's also elemental application for you to be able to trigger reactions or for him to be able to trigger reactions like when he triggers bloom in hyper bloom teams, which in turn lets you trigger hyper bloom. So having three more seconds of it is generally more relevant than each hit doing more damage. But C3 is still not bad. C4 is a constellation that generally doesn't do too much, but is very useful in specific teams, mainly in national teams where you can actually spend your buff up time on him because your carry snapshots the buffs. You don't have to stay on your carry and keep attacking. So it represents a relatively significant nuke in those teams. But outside of those teams, it doesn't tend to be all that significant. C5 is basically a worse version of C4, right? It does the same thing. It increases E damage, but it, it increases it by less. And then uh, C6 gives him every third hit launches five swords instead of instead of two or three so it goes from alternating between two and three to alternating between two three and five effectively right instead of 2.5 per hit it goes to 3.3 per hit on average uh, which is a nice increase of the damage but it's mostly a double hydro application on that five hit so it increases his elemental application and energy refund on every every third hit like that which ends up reducing his burst cost by about 12 to 15 depending on your team all in all all of his constellations past c1 do something c2 and c6 being the two biggest ones he doesn't honestly need constellations constellations to be good he's still a good unit at c0 but obviously at c0 you're sacrificing a lot more for his upsides he still has the upsides of better hydro app and more defensive utility but it doesn't last as long the hydro app isn't as much better than the alternatives as it is once you reach those higher cons and his personal damage is a lot lower next barbara c1 generates one energy every 10 seconds that's two energy per rotation for an 80 cost burst this is a constellation that makes it so that barbara as an overworld healer can use her burst every few minutes that is all this does c2 decreases the cooldown of her skill, which lets you get slightly better uptime and gains hydro damage bonus. The hydro damage bonus doesn't matter too much. She's not often used 
mean, she's not often used at all, but in the few teams where she is used, generally, you're not really relying on another Hydro damage dealer. The cooldown reduction, though, does matter a little bit because obviously she doesn't have 100% uptime. Even with this, she doesn't have 100% uptime. So it, it, it helps her uptime a little bit. That being said, the main team where Barbara is actually a reasonable option is Nilo teams. In Nilo teams, you want to be running her on Sack Frag. And if you have Sack Frag, this doesn't really matter because you don't want to double cast your E. You just want to cast your E, prog the Sack Frag, swap out. And then if you have high enough refine on your Sack Frag, next time you swap to her, you cast your E, the Sack Frag cooldown is back up anyways. So this doesn't end up doing anything. But it's somewhat useful if your Sack Frag is low, calm, uh, low refinement, I guess. C3 increases her burst healing. Doesn't really matter. Healers in this game tend to heal enough without things like this. C4, every time Barbara hits charge attacks, she generates one energy per opponent hit, which is completely useless. Skill talent levels, which doesn't really matter. And character revive every 15 minutes, which also doesn't really matter. All in all, you get her for free and her constellations don't do much for her. So her being on a banner is pretty bad. Finally, you have Yanfei. Yanfei is a character who at C6 is like a fine-ish damage dealer, but not very good. You'll be able to reach the DPS checks, but she's going to be relying a lot more on the rest of your team's damage than some of the better carries do. That being said, like, you will be able to clear stuff with her if you're using her as a carry. I, I like, I want to make that clear. She's not bad. She's also not great, and that's at C6, and before that, obviously, well, she's worse. C1 reduces stamina consumption of charge attacks. You're not supposed to run out of stamina on her to begin with. This helps a little bit if you need to dash a lot, but it generally shouldn't be that much of a problem anyways. It, it's fine. C2, increased charge attack crit rate by 20% against enemies below 50% HP. The main issue with it is that you don't want to have to build for it and scuff your crit ratio, especially on Yanfei, whose optimal crit ratio is actually not 1 to 2. And it's because she triggers an additional effect when she crits. When she crits on her charge attack, she gets an additional instance of damage. This is damage that happens when you crit, which is functionally similar to crit damage. And because of that, it makes it so that you want to build a bit more crit rate, a bit over one to two for an optimal crit ratio. Now that's not that big of a deal because honestly, the damage difference between one to two and two to three, which is the general range of, a, of an optimal ratio for her, isn't even that large, but it is one thing to keep in mind. And if you are building more two to three than one to two, it's even more likely that you're a above 80% and then you don't get full value out of this. And then more importantly, effects that apply on enemies below 50% HP are significantly worse than effects that apply on enemies that are above 50% HP. Because the reality is that in most cases, you're doing your attacks in such a way that the attack that brings the enemy below 50% HP doesn't bring them to 49.9. It generally brings them to like 45 or 40 or even 30. If they're squishy, it might be to like 20 or 10. And that makes it so that this 20% crit rate doesn't actually apply to half of her damage. It almost always applies to less than half of her damage. It's still somewhat useful, but it's not actually that great. C3, that's the skill, so it's completely dog shit. Yeah, okay. C4 is quite good. It gives you a shield, which opens up the possibility of playing Shield Fae, right? Of playing Yanfei as a shielder. And that's actually not terrible because the shield that she gives is actually pretty big. If you're playing a team where Pyro Application would be a downside or where you can't take advantage of Toma's shield because you're not doing enough normal attacks, then Tank Fae in some situations can perform as well or better than Toma. That being said, Yanfei's ER requirements in teams where she's used as a shielder are incredibly high. So high that in most situations, you cannot get away with a weapon that doesn't give you energy. You have to use either Fav or Prototype Amber, which removes the upside of her being a catalyst and being able to use TDDS. And some teams you generate enough energy that you can, but that is something to keep in mind. That being said though, this is also very underrated as a constellation for her as a carry because shields in general are a form of resistance to interruption. And getting that in your kit is pretty valuable as anyone who <laughs> pulls for the five stars that give interruption resistance that C1 would tell you. You can feel the difference and it's actually relatively relevant for that. Her C5 is fine. If I remember correctly, the damage 
on charge attacks keep scaling past level 10 yeah it does right so it's effectively more so about the eight percent charge attack damage bonus you get than it is about the higher multiplier but even that isn't even that big of an increase and then on top of that you have the very unfortunate reality and the main reason why yanfei is not that great of a carry which is that you generally cannot burst with yanfei every rotation unless you give her a lot of er and it's generally not really worth building a lot of er on carry yanfei over building more offensive stats and you're generally better off bursting every other rotation when you're not getting enough particles from enemies if she could actually burst every rotation without building er she would actually be a lot more competitive with the stronger pyro carries and if you're at high investment where you can kill enemies in one rotation and you get a lot of hp particles from killing enemies you can reach clear times that are actually not that far behind the other pyro carries so if you really really like unfaith she's one of those characters that definitely can be made to work at high investment well enough to, to to clear stuff without much of a problem but even then right you're probably not starting the next chamber with your burst and at level 10 this is like a little bit over 50 i think it's 54 around 50 missing around 50 charge attack damage bonus on a character whose main source of damage is charge attacks and missing the scarlet seal generation from the burst which lets you do reliable three stack and two c's what i'm trying to make here is just she does a lot more damage with her burst than without and so actually not being able to get the burst of rotation is really the main reason why she's not that great but yeah if you want to play her as your carry and you really like her obviously her being on the banner is going to be nice for you but if that's not the case her only relevant relevant constellation is going to be c4 and even then it's only relevant in very very niche situations so because of that she's definitely one of the worst characters for there to be on a banner that leaves us with four stars that are incredibly bad incredibly good and solidly below average to compare this to nevilette's previous banner which was saying so official diona it's significantly worse that being said it might still be worth to pull on this banner for some of you guys because of the five stars so let's get right into the five stars now starting with Kazuha Kazuha he's been rerun a few times now so I've talked about him many times before he's a pretty good character and he works in a lot of teams he generally tends to be a much more versatile option because he works in almost any team that would want an animal unit even in the teams where he has worse synergy than some of the other animal options he's still a functional option all right so for example even in taser teams where can afford to on-field Sucrose. Kazuha's still good and honestly relatively similar in strength because his off-field application is so good that him not having relevant on-field almost doesn't matter. Similar for aggravate teams that focus on off-field electros like Beto and Fischl where he's still even though not necessarily the best option really not far behind and then in teams like National where Sucrose also I think tends to be better he's still not bad but unlike Sucrose, he actually has a lot more use case in non-reaction teams. And I think especially with more recent character releases, that started to matter a bit more. All right, so that's something that is, in my opinion, a little bit different from, from his last rerun. They, they've released a few more non-reaction focused units where Sucrose isn't quite as good for him or for, for those for those teams, All right? Like Linny, like a bunch of Nebulet teams. And so I'd say that his overall value has gone slightly up because of that but also on like on the other hand they've also released more teams that are good without him so when it comes to if you want to whale on him or dolphin on him or whatever you want to call it c1 is all right it increases his energy generation but it also increases his field time but it also increases his damage so it's not always worth using because in a decent amount of teams you start some of your setup before you go on him and a lot of teams where you use him with Bennett for example you use Bennett's burst before you go on him so using an additional E on him before you go to your carry eats into your carry's burst up time on Bennett so it's not always necessarily worth using but in a decent amount of teams it is and it gives you some more versatility for your grouping so it's still not a bad constellation C2 gives you EM and I think Kazuha C2 is one of the most overrated constellations 
teams in the game. It's not bad, don't get me wrong, but in teams that aren't reaction focused, it really doesn't do that much. So outside of your vape and melt teams where you use Kazuha, if you're using Kazuha in a Nevilet team, if you're using Kazuha in a Linny team, if you're using Kazuha in Freeze team, a Monocryo team, this constellation doesn't actually do that much. It's not completely useless because 200 EM is more personal damage on him and a slightly bigger buff for his team. But if the characters you're buffing can't take advantage of that 200 EM buff, and all you're getting is um, the EM buff for Kazuha and slightly higher damage percent buff from that EM, this is a pretty weak constellation overall. If you are playing one of those teams where you're playing Vape, you're playing Melt, you're playing Aggravate, where the EM increase on your other units is actually relevant and useful, then this is probably about as good as you would expect reading it. But if you're not, it really isn't that big of a deal, right? And, and that's what I mean when I say that it's overrated. I think a lot of people don't really realize that it's only actually good or like actually great in in a few teams c3 doesn't really do too much c4 is fine it helps with his er requirements for a c4 on a five star it's not great though c5 fine c6 is funny it's like relatively good if you want to play him as an on-fielder for example it's pretty good you can use it with xianyun as well now which is quite funny you can use the c6 animal infusion to trigger a reaction on your weapon with other infusions like bennett's c6 and that can get you a swirl and that can apply vv to enemies which is very funny it's actually a relatively good constellation but it's a c6 so you know it's not worth it but within c6 it's 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 an all right one like it's not it's not disappointing and dog shit and i'll just quickly mention his signature weapon his signature weapon is not very good mainly because because it doesn't give him ER. It gives him EM and it gives him a team buff, but in a lot of teams, if you go for his signature, you're gonna either not use your ult ever rotation or need incredible artifacts in terms of ER to be able to use an EM sense, otherwise you're gonna be using an ER sense, and the fact that this EM main stat doesn't really matter anymore. And then the buff you get from it is actually often not that great. There's not too many characters that can use both the normal charge and plunge attack buff and the attack buff. Most carries tend to either like only use one of them or at least only use one of them well and most importantly fav sword on him is so good and sack sword much like his c1 gives you a lot of flexibility with your grouping which makes it so that the actual gain that you get from his signature is one of the lowest out of any support weapons and support weapons tend to do less than carry weapons for the specific team you're using them on they tend to be more versatile as well but for a given team they tend to do less there's a few exceptions obviously but and so being a below average support weapon is it makes it very hard to justify going for it over stuff like constellations but yeah we'll get into into the weapons the weapon a little bit more later for now let's talk about nevilet i think it's a surprise to no one that nevilet is a pretty good character he's an overall very good carry most of the teams that you use him on most of his good teams have a a bit more damage coming from the supports than people realize but but they're they're all like they're fairly strong teams the main thing that makes him good though isn't oh he's an insane character he does so much damage while wow, poggers it's that he is a good character that does good damage but also he's really easy to play compared to other characters which makes it so that in most situations you're going to end up playing Nevilet closer to his theoretical limit than you would other units, which is going to make him, in practice, perform better than you'd expect just looking at how much damage a character can output. This passive, right, his Ascension 1, gives him additional damage on his charge attack based on how many Hydro reactions you've triggered in the past 30 seconds, which effectively translates to he gains more damage based on how many different elements you have in your party with the asterisk that some enemies can help you get additional stacks of this. What that means is that teams where you play him with another Hydro unit, like with Farina for example, when you're able to get an additional stack from the enemies are going to perform significantly better, right? It goes from 125% to 160%, which is a pretty significant increase, right? Pretty close to 25% increase on his personal damage, just from being able to get a reaction from an enemy. 
what that does is effectively it creates a situation where he will perform even better in those teams when the enemies let you get a stack for free. Now, if you want to whale on him, C1 gets you one stack for free, which is pretty good. Getting one stack for free makes it so that in those teams, you always get that 25%-ish more damage. However, the fact that you can, against some enemies, get that stack anyways, means that against those enemies, the C1 does not increase his damage. The other part of his... C1 is that he gets much higher resistance to interruption while doing charge attacks, which honestly I'd argue matters more than the damage increase from it because it just removes some of the very few downsides that Nevidet has, which is that if he gets staggered mid charge attack, he loses the balls that he used for his charge attack. He doesn't like they don't drop back. You don't get like, oh, you did a third of your charge attack. So you get two balls back. No, you just lose them. So if you get staggered, you your damage will go down pretty significantly that being said a lot of teams can afford to run defensive options with him because he doesn't have a lot of supports that work too well with him for his damage which makes defensive options with him pretty good because you're not sacrificing as much damage right there's no there's no hp focused bena that you're missing out on if you're running a shielder and that lack of too many synergistic buffers for him lets him get away with defensive options more easily and on top of that he has the ability to kite backwards while he's doing his charge attack right where the enemy's attacks all mostly or many of them right you can just dodge by moving around right and by keeping your distance and even when you do get hit, as long as you time your charge attack well, you can still often get most of your charge attack out before getting hit. And because he has so much healing in his kit, right? Every time you charge attack, you heal half of your HP and you're an HP scaler, so you're going to have a lot of HP to begin with. And you don't get punished very hard for being low HP, right? Like technically, he gains damage percent based on his HP percentage, but it's not that much damage. So he doesn't actually get punished too hard for being low HP. It effectively makes it so that you can kind of just get away without a uh, form of resistance or interruption in a lot of situations. Now, obviously, Primo Vishap is not the most aggressive enemy, so there are still going to be enemies where the resistance or interruption from C1 matters a bit more. All of this is to just to say that it's not always going to be necessary. Anyway, so his C1 effectively, right? If if you're getting value out of the resistance to, inter resistance to interruption and you're getting value out of the stack is one of the best C1s in the game for carries, if not the best. But there are going to be situations where it does literally nothing because you're already dodging the attacks and you get a stack from, from, from the enemies. Like for example, when you're fighting Jade Bloom Terror Shroom, you can get a stack from its self dendro infusion and its attacks tend to be pretty easy to dodge, especially if you're not applying Electro to it. And so against an enemy like that, his C1 is gonna be overall kind of useless. On top of that, uh, if you don't have Farina, his better teams don't necessarily want double elements and there's a decent amount of them where you kind of just run three elements anyways. And and if you're doing that, then you don't gain much value from that. And that mainly comes from the fact that the Hydra units other than Farina don't actually tend to synergize that well with him. C2, it gives him crit damage on his charge attacks. Pretty all right. I will say though, because he is a character who runs Marie C and gets a gets crit ascension crit on him is not actually as valuable what i mean by that is that crit buffs once you start getting a lot of crit value actually do reach the same quote unquote not really but kind of diminishing returns as other stats and once you reach a lot of crit damage like you do on nevilet because of crit ascension marie chaussee and if you're considering c2 potential signature weapon that gives a lot of crit this 42 percent crit damage ends up being a little bit less valuable than it would be on another character like if you're running you start at 98.4 cv because you're uh 88.4 crit damage base plus five percent crit rate all right 62.2 from your circlet 72 from marie chaussee if you're getting what is it 88.2 from his weapon and then a high investment nevidet build uh, so I'll use, I'll use higher assumptions than i usually do for my calcs will generally have upwards of between 25 and 30 crit stuff let's do 25 for now 25 times 6.6 percent this is gonna be a 100 to 285 
ratio. Or before before Marichal say it's gonna be 64 to 285. More realistically, it's very hard to get exactly 64, so probably more like 60 to 93. All right, which is effectively 96 to 93. With C2, you'd go up to 335, which is a percentage increase of about 10%. Whereas if you were running a character with a lot less crit value, starting at 200, this increase would be a little bit higher, 14%. Character that doesn't run Marichal Sage, doesn't have a crit weapon, right? Maybe starting at 70, 140, about 15%. So it's not that big of a deal, but it is worth you know, keeping in mind. And I guess another thing to keep in mind is if you are considering this, especially if you have his signature weapon, when you are reaching these levels of crit damage where you're at like, like over four, over 500 CV, even though it doesn't look as pretty, there's a lot of situations where HP circlet becomes better than crit damage circlet. And also HP substats can become better than crit substats. Not necessarily. In order to know for your specific build what's better, you're gonna have to use the optimizer. But that is something to keep in mind. Keep an eye out for HP substats. Keep an eye out for HP main stats. C3, normal attack talent level, pretty good. C4, when he's on the field and healed, generate a, sor a source water droplet up to once every four seconds. The main upside of this is that it reduces some of the cringe that happens when you accidentally pick up the wrong ball, which is something I've talked about in the Nevilet Ask the Jeff. Sometimes you pick up the wrong ball and you're basically you pick up an, a newer ball instead of an older ball. And when you do that, one of your older balls can expire before you would want to pick it up. And so when that happens, you can get value out of this. Generally though, C4 by itself isn't all that good. C5, pretty bad. And then C6 is pretty good. It makes retroactively C4 a decent amount better because, well, you're now generating more droplets. It, it lets him effectively absorb droplets mid-charge attack instead of having to start a new one. And it makes his charge attack deal more damage. Overall, he's got pretty good constellations, uh, but he also is not reliant on any of those constellations to be a good unit. And then finally, we're going to move on to the weapon banner. Well, obviously, we're going to talk, start by talking about Choma the Eternal Flow and how it compares to Nevilet's cons. The thing about Choma the Eternal Flow is that it is actually a pretty good signature, but Nevilet also has a really good battle pass weapon. What that means is that in a lot of teams, if you are a battle pass buyer and you're planning on staying a battle pass buyer long enough to get refines on Sacrificial Jade, Choma the Eternal Flow is a relatively minor damage increase. That being said, if you are not a battle pass buyer or if you're not refining Sack Jade, it's a much better option. One effect that's a bit hard to quantify of his free to play option, which is Prototype Amber, is that if you're playing him with Farina, you front load your fanfare generation a little bit more. But more importantly, whether you're playing him with Farina or not, you get some healing which can help team survivability in general. It's very rare for your Nevilet to die. I'd say in the past few abysses, the only situations that have ever felt somewhat threatening for Nivillet have been whenever the Dendro balls are on screen. But if you press E while they're shielded, mate, you instantly break their shield because the Pneuma hit one shots the shield. The only somewhat dangerous situation as of late is something that his kit literally has a hard counter for. But his high HP, high healing, and self peel through kiting doesn't apply to the rest of his team. And so getting some healing from Prototype Amber is something that you can't really quantify how good it is, but I've definitely felt the difference when I'm playing Proto Amber versus when I'm not, especially in non Farina teams where you don't get Farina healing from overheal on his own things when I'm playing teams without healers. That being said, his, his signature weapon is still quite good. They learned from their mistakes in the past that when you have a character who has some ER requirements, if you give their signature weapon no ER requirements, it, it's gonna feel like shit for a lot of people. And so they gave it some, some energy generation. Uh, overall, it's just a quite good stat stake, but it's not a particularly versatile weapon. It can be used on some other characters, uh, but not too many, right? Mainly, like, it, it's a fine weapon on Risley. But outside of Risley, generally, it's basically just a crit damage stat stake. A decent one, don't get me wrong, but not really that great, especially because there is a standard banner crit stat stick through Lost Prayers, 
that uh, a bunch of people got just from standard banner bullshit. And considering that Widsith is such a strong four-star weapon in general. All this is saying, it is good on him, but there's a few situations where it's not that big of an increase on him, and it's not a particularly versatile weapon. To go a little bit more into the situations where it's not that big of a of an increase for him, in general, compared to R5 Sack Jade, it's gonna hover in the like 10 to 15% damage increase range when you're taking advantage of this energy generation. However, in Farina teams, Farina's hydro particle generation significantly alleviates Nivilet's ER requirements and make this a lot less useful slash necessary, or rather, it makes weapons that don't have energy generation close the gap to some extent, right? Because this effect stops being quite useful or stop, stops being as useful. It's still useful because going higher going higher ER than your ER requirements is just comfortable, right? It's just always really comfortable to have more ER than you need, especially because in basically all like, every single situation in this game, you kill enemies not on the last hit of your rotation, but somewhere in the middle. It's very rare that the en enemy has exactly enough HP for your full rotation's damage. And when you kill the enemies somewhere in the middle, some energy that you would generate at the end gets lost. And so going higher ER or going more ER than you need is still comfortable, especially when you're getting to the next chamber of abyss or stuff like that. That being said, that comfort is definitely not worth the amount of pulls that it takes to get a signature weapon from the weapon banner. When you're playing him in teams with Farina where the ER requirements aren't as necessary and all this does is comfort, the actual num numerical difference between this and High Refined Sack Jade is single digit and low single digit, like around 5% or less. And if you're doing actual speedrun stuff on him and you're playing him with some of his vape speedrun teams, it can actually be worse than Sack Jade. Because if you can take advantage of the EM you get from Sack Jade, obviously that gives it another another edge. All of this to say, if you are a Battle Pass buyer, this weapon isn't nearly as good. At R1, the difference is a lot bigger because so much of Sack Jade's power is in how strong its passive is. 32 HP at R1, 64 at R5. But for a lot of people, you're looking at getting constellations or signature weapons in terms of how much it improves your character. And I'd say that generally, if you're playing him with Farina, his C1 is going to do more for you than his signature. And if you're playing him without Farina, it's a lot more up in the air and the signature can be better. You should also keep in mind that weapon banners are rough because 50-50s don't carry over through weapon banners. And so in order to guarantee a weapon, you will need to be able to reach pity three times. Otherwise, you might get it, but you won't be able to guarantee it. More specifically, there is a 75-25 on a weapon banner, 75% that you get a raid up weapon, 25% that you don't. And that does carry over as far as I'm aware. So if you got Lost Prayers on this banner, for example, you're guaranteed to get either Freedom Sword or Tome, but you're not guaranteed Tome, you're guaranteed one of these two. And if you're only going for one of them, then that effectively doesn't matter. It slightly increases your odds from 37.5 to 50, but it's still not a guarantee. And the only actual guarantee is once you've reached two Fate Points, your next five star is guaranteed, which means you need to reach Pity three times. Or you need to, if you want to be sure you can guarantee it, you need to have enough wishes to reach pity three times. Now, not, you don't need to reach hard pity three times because statistically so improbable that you can treat it as impossible that you reach hard pity at all, let alone three times in a row. But reaching soft pity three times in a row is actually somewhat likely. And so having 210 plus wishes is generally what you're going to need if you want to actually guarantee you'll get this. And that's why I generally don't like weapon banners and don't recommend weapon banners. The fact that, that guarantees don't carry over, right? The fact that fate points don't carry over makes it really, really rough unless you've stockpiled a lot of wishes. And if you're spending 210 wishes and all you get out of it is one five-star weapon, that's a huge waste. Which is why, when I'm looking at weapon banners, I often try to talk about how good the four stars are. Which, hey, look at that. Isn't that a good segue? Let's talk about how good the four stars are. Trash, 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 great, good. 
Five Lance is great. Multiple Five Lances is quite useful. Five Lance is John Lee's best weapon in most teams. Five Lance is Shang Ling's best weapon in teams where you're using Shang Ling as an elemental applicator instead of a carry. Or okay, best four star weapon. Five Lance is Raiden's best four star weapon when you're playing Rational. Five Lance is Rosaria's best weapon in most of the teams where you play Rosaria, or best four star weapon in most of the teams where you play Rosaria. Five Lance is Yao Yao's best weapon. It's uh, Mika's best weapon, full stop. It's Shenhe's best four star weapon, and honestly, often not that far behind her signature. It's Chevreur's best weapon, full stop. It's Toma's best weapon in a lot of teams. That's a lot of characters, right? It is the point I'm making. Five Lance is a great weapon. I mean, the Five series in general is a great series of weapons, and individual Five weapons are better or worse based on how many good characters can use them. And there's a lot of good polearm characters that want to use Five. That being said, it's not enough to carry a banner. One weapon being great isn't enough for the five stars or for the four star weapons to be quite good, right? Like you need more than one. The next best weapon on this banner is five greatsword. And five greatsword is basically the exact opposite of five lands. There's very few Playmore characters that are both good and five users. It's a fine weapon on Noel in solo geo teams, but I'm not a fan of solo geo Noel teams. And if you're a Noel main, you probably want her to deal damage. And if you're not a Noel main, you probably shouldn't play Noel. It's often Dory's best weapon, but Dory's not great. It's often Sayu's best weapon, but Sayu's not great. It's often Chong Yun's best weapon, but Chong Yun's not great. You're seeing the pattern, hopefully. I'd say that its main upside is a high refine. I like playing it on Gumming because Gumming is a character whose energy generation gets so f if he kills enemies mid rotation that sacrificing damage for ER feels almost necessary if you if you want to play him often. Uh, so I like it on Gumming. If you're playing Dea as a defensive option in stuff like Linny teams, it's fine on her. I guess same for Shinyan. And it's good when you're using solo Electro Beto as a defensive utility option, even if it's not great damage when you're playing solo Electro Beto on Fav. And then obviously Obviously, it's best in slot on Thundering Furry, but I am under no delusion that Thundering Furry is a great team. Uh, I guess it's also a decent option for Kave. Yeah, I'd say that like mainly Beto and Gumming are like the two characters for which Fav feels relevant. Anyways, Midranacht Walls. I don't think I need to go into detail about why it's bad. It's a physical damage bow. There is no physical damage bow user. The Flute, it's an attack stat stick with a motion value passive that does physical damage and it's not a lot of physical damage. It's generally a downgrade to the craftables. And then Wine and Song is just complete d it. Arguably the worst gacha weapon that exists. It's an ER weapon that increases your attack when you sprint. There aren't really characters who actually need ER and can make use of this passive. If it had an attack substat, it would be a decent stat stick for someone like Wanderer, for example. And if you look at how many stats it gives overall, it's not actually that bad. All right, if you compare it to a similar weapon in Ultimate Overlord's Mega Magic Sword, at R5, it gives you 48% attack, and it's also base attack main stat ER substat. And this one is actually useful because it has a user. So like, if you're just looking at the amount of stats that it gives, at R5, it's not a terrible stat stick, but it's a gacha weapon with a passive that is worse than an event weapon. Maybe one day we'll have a catalyst character who wants to dash cancel stuff, but other than that, like this part of the passive just doesn't matter. All this to say, it's dog shit, it's not good. I guess final thoughts on Freedom Sworn. I've already talked about how generally little of an upgrade Freedom Sworn is, if it's an upgrade at all. When I play on accounts that have Freedom Sworn, it's honestly generally a 50 50 whether I use Freedom Sworn or Fav, depending on the team. If you're someone who, like me, plays a lot of different teams you don't really notice when you're doing five percent less damage but you sure as f notice it when you're missing 20 percent er and so an additional layer to to, to the freedom sworn stuff is because there are some teams where with freedom sworn you won't have the er requirements not just on kazuha but also on your other characters even if 
I had it personally, I would probably leave him on five most of the time. Okay, maybe that's not true. Just because I only have one five sword. Oh yeah, actually speak, speaking of that, learn from my mistake, okay? Back in like 2021 or early 22, before I started theater crafting this game properly, I made the mistake of refining my five sword, uh, R3. And I have not gotten a single five sword since. If you are getting five lands from this banner, keep in mind, it is a very good weapon on multiple characters. It is generally going to be better to have two R1 five lances if you're playing two characters that want it than it would be to have one R2. My personal recommendation is lances specifically because there's so many users, I'd probably want to keep at least three. Swords, there's not as many users, so two should generally be fine, but personally, I'd still want three or more. Claymores, there's barely one character but they might come up, come out with new characters in the future that want them. So I'd recommend keeping two. Catalysts, I think that the Catalyst characters that want five generally have decent alternatives. For example, Baiju can use Prototype Amber. Nahida can use a more damage focused weapon. So five Codex is probably the one that I feel the least bad about not keeping multiple copies of. And then five bow, I'd also probably want to keep at least two. Overall, I'd say that this banner is not great. If you are a vertical investment Navidad player, right? If you, like you are specifically wishing for characters that fit his teams, you're going really high. Like you've been farming Marie Jose for artifacts for him forever. You want to, you're, you're triple crowning him, all that good stuff, right? This banner is not that bad because Freedom Sworn is actually good on Kazuha in Nebulet teams because Kazuha won't necessarily want to use his burst in Nebulet teams. There's a decent amount of situations where you just don't. And you generally don't need the ER on Nebulet himself in uh, Nebulet Farina teams. So Freedom Sworn is pretty good in those teams. That being said, it's not even that much of an upgrade over just using Iron Sting because you can't take advantage of the attack buff. It's only the, it's only the damage buff. And then... If you're not a Nebulet player, you don't really want this as a stat stick, you're better off going for a different stat stick. Outside of that, if you're considering Freedom Sworn for Kazuha and you don't have Nebulet or you don't play Nebulet or you already have his weapon or whatever, this banner is gonna, is gonna be the death of you. It's really not good. So this is definitely not a very good banner to go for if you're someone who wants to improve your Kazuha. Whereas if you're someone who wants to improve your Nebulet, it's an okay-ish banner to go for. Uh, final thoughts on the character banners. Overall, the five stars are very good. The four stars are slightly below average, I would say, right? With, with Sinto being great, but the other two not being there. And then if you've been playing for a while and you already have C6 Sinto, then this banner is even worse. However, these are five stars that are good enough to potentially go for their banner. If you're if you're if you're thinking of going for these characters, you can just keep that in mind. They're pretty good characters and generally good enough that you can pay less attention to what the four stars are. If you want more details about Kazuha specifically or Nebulet specifically, make sure you check out the Ask the Jeff videos. But yeah, so that's gonna be it. I went into a lot more detail than I usually do on banner reviews. Let me know if you think that's something that's if you liked that, because I'm thinking of trying to do this for all the banners from now on, but I also know that the algorithm doesn't tend to be that nice to videos that are too long. The, the whole point of these banner reviews is to help people figure out whether they want to go for the banner or, or not. So if no one sees it, then it's not a helpful video, right? So let, let me know, let me know if how much you like this format compared to the other formats. If you'd prefer something more concise as well, let me know. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye YouTube.